Zuleika Dobson by Max Beerbohm, an Oxford love story. But the loveliest face in all the world will not please you if you see it suddenly, eye to eye, at a distance of half an inch from your own. And that quote is from Max Beerbohm. Zuleika Dobson. That old bell, presage of a train, had just sounded through Oxford Station, and the undergraduates who were waiting there, gay figures in tweed or flannel, moved to the margin of the platform and gazed idly up the line. Young and careless in the glow of the afternoon sunshine, they struck a sharp note of incongruity with the worn boards they stood on, with the fading signals and grey eternal walls of that antique station, which, familiar to them and insignificant, does yet whisper to the tourist the last enchantments of the Middle Age. At the door of the first-class waiting room, aloof and venerable, stood the Warden of Judas. An ebon pillar of tradition seemed he, in his garb of old-fashioned cleric. Aloft between the wide brim of his silk hat and the white extent of his shirt front, appeared those eyes which hawks, that nose which eagles, had often envied. He supported his ears on an ebon stick. He alone was worthy of the background. Came a whistle from the distance, the breast of an engine was descried, and a long train curving after it, under a flight of smoke. It grew and grew, louder and louder. Its noise foreran it. It became a furious, enormous monster, and with an instinct for safety, all men receded from the platform's margin yet came there with it unknown to them, a danger far more terrible than itself. Into the station it came blustering with cloud and clangor. Ere it yet had stopped, the door of one carriage flew open, and from it, in a white traveling dress, in a toque a twinkle with fine diamonds, a lithe and radiant creature slipped nimbly down to the platform, a sinister indeed, a hundred eyes were fixed on her and half as many hearts lost to her. The warden of Judas himself had mounted on his nose a pair of black rimmed glasses. Him espying, the nymph darted in his direction. The throng made way for her. She was at his side. Grandpa, she cried and kissed the old man on either cheek. Not a youth there but would have bartered fifty years of his future for that salute. My dear Zuleika, he said, welcome to Oxford. Have you no luggage? Heaps, she answered, and a maid who will find it. Then, said the warden, let us drive straight to college. He offered her his arm, and they proceeded slowly to the entrance. She chatted gaily, blushing not in the long avenue of eyes she passed through. All the youths under her spell were now quite oblivious of the relatives they had come to meet. Parents, sisters, cousins ran unclaimed about the platform. Undutiful, all the youths were forming a serried suite to their enchantress. In silence, they followed her. They saw her leap into the warden's landau. They saw the warden seat himself upon her left. Nor was it until the landau was lost to sight that they turned, how slowly and with how bad a grace, to look for their relatives. Through those slums which connect Oxford with the world, the landau rolled on towards Judas. Not many youths occurred, for nearly all, it was the Monday of Eights Week, were down by the river cheering the crews. There did, however, come spurring by on a polo pony, a very splendid youth. His straw hat was encircled with a ribbon of blue and white, and he raised it to the warden. That, said the warden, is the Duke of Dorset, a member of my college. He dines at my table tonight. Zuleika, turning to regard his grace, saw that he had not reined in and was not even glancing back at her over his shoulder. She gave a little start of dismay, but scarcely had her lips pouted ere they curved to a smile, a smile with no malice in its corners. As the Landau rolled into, quote, the corn, end of quote, another youth, a pedestrian and very different, saluted the warden. He wore a black jacket, rusty and amorphous. 
His trousers were too short and he himself was too short, almost a dwarf. His face was as plain as his gait was undistinguished. He squinted behind spectacles. And who is that? asked Zuleika. A deep flush overspread the cheek of the warden. That, he said, is also a member of Judas. His name, I believe, is Noakes. Is he dining with us tonight? asked Zuleika. Certainly not, said the warden. Most decidedly not. Noakes, unlike the duke, had stopped for an ardent retrospect. He gazed till the Landau was out of his short sight, then sighing, resumed his solitary walk. The Landau was rolling into the broad, over that ground which had once blackened under the faggots lit for Latimer and Ridley. It rolled past the portals of Balliol and of Trinity, past the Ashmolean, from those pedestals which interspersed the railing of the Sheldonian, the high, grim busts of the Roman emperors, stared down at the fair stranger in the equipage. Zuleika returned their stare with but a casual glance. The inanimate had little charm for her. A moment later, a certain old Don emerged from Blackwell's where he had been buying books. Looking across the road, he saw, to his amazement, great beads of perspiration glistening on the brows of those emperors. He trembled and hurried away. That evening in common room, he told what he had seen, and no amount of polite skepticism would convince him that it was but the hallucination of one who had been reading too much Momsen. He persisted that he had seen what he described. It was not until two days had elapsed that some credence was accorded him. Yes, as the Landau rolled by, sweat started from the brows of the emperors. They, at least, foresaw the peril that was overhanging Oxford, and they gave such warnings as they could. Let that be remembered to their credit. Let that incline us to think more gently of them. In their lives, we know they were infamous, some of them. Nile non commissarunt stupri, servicie, impietitis. But are they too little punished after all here in Oxford, exposed eternally and inexorably to heat and frost, to the four winds that lash them and the rains that wear them away? They are expiating in effigy the abominations of their pride and cruelty and lust. Who were leches? They are without bodies. Who were tyrants? They are crowned never but with crowns of snow. Who made themselves even with the gods are crowned never but with crowns of snow. Who made themselves even with the gods? They are by American visitors frequently mistaken for the twelve apostles. It is but a little way down the road that the two bishops perished for their faith. And even now we do never pass the spot without a tear for them. Yet how quickly they died in the flames. To these emperors, for whom none weeps, time will give no surcease. Surely it is a sign of some grace in them that they rejoiced not this bright afternoon in the evil that was to befall the city of their penance. The sun streamed through the bay window of a best bedroom in the warden's house and glorified the pale crayon portraits on the wall. The dimity curtains, the old fresh chintz. He invaded the many trunks which all painted ZD, gaped in various stages of excavation around the room. The doors of the huge wardrobe stood like the doors of Janus Temple in time of war majestically open, and the sun seized this opportunity of exploring the mahogany recesses. But the carpet, which had faded under his immemorial visitations, was now almost entirely hidden from him, hidden under layers of fair, fine linen, layers of silk, brocade, chatin, satin, chiffon, muslin. All the colors of the rainbow materialized by modistes were there. Stacked on chairs where I know not what of sachets, glove cases, fan cases. There were innumerable packages in silver paper and pink ribbons. There was a pyramid of bandboxes. There was a virgin forest of boot trees and rustling quickly hither and thither, in and out of this profusion with armfuls of finery, was an obviously French maid, alert, unerring, 
Like a swallow, she dipped and darted. Nothing escaped her, and she never rested. She had the air of the born unpacker, swift and firm, yet withal tender. Scarce had her arms been laden, but their loads were lying lightly between shelves or tightly in drawers. To calculate, catch, distribute, seemed in her but a single process. She was one of those who were born to make chaos cosmic. In so much that ere the loud chapel clock told another hour, all the trunks had been sent empty away, the carpet was unflecked by any scrap of silver paper. From the mantelpiece, photographs of Zuleika surveyed the room with a possessive air. Zuleika's pin cushion, a bristle with new pens, lay on the dimity flounced toilet table, and round it stood a multitude of multiform glass vessels, domed, all of them with dull gold, on which ZD in zeonites and diamonds was encrusted. On a small table stood a great casket of malachite, initialed in like fashion. On another small table stood Zuleika's library. Both books were in covers of dull gold. On the back of one cover, Bradshaw in barrels was encrusted. On the back of the other, ABC Guide in amethysts, barrels, chrysoprases and garnets, and Zuleika's great shovel glass stood ready to reflect her. Always it traveled with her in a great case specially made for it. It was framed in ivory, and of fluted ivory were the slim columns it swung between. Of gold were its twin sconces, and four tall tapers stood in each of them. The door opened, and the warden, with hospitable words, left his granddaughter at the threshold. Zuleika wandered to her mirror. Undress me, Melison, she said. Like all who were wont to appear by night before the public, she had the habit of resting towards sunset. Presently, Melison withdrew her mistress in a white peignoir tied with a blue sash, lay in a great chintz chair, gazing out of the bay window. The quadrangle below was very beautiful, with its walls of rugged gray, its cloisters, its grass carpet. But to her it was of no more interest than if it had been the rattling courtyard to one of those hotels in which she spent her life. She saw it, but heeded it not. She seemed to be thinking of herself, or of something she desired, or of someone she had never met. There was ennui, and there was wistfulness in her gaze. Yet one would have guessed these things to be transient, to be no more than the little shadows that sometimes pass between a bright mirror and the brightness it reflects. Zuleika was not strictly beautiful. Her eyes were a trifle large and their lashes longer than they need have been. An anarchy of small curls was her chevalor, a dark upland of misrule. Every hair asserting its rights over a not discreditable brow. For the rest, her features were not at all original. They seemed to have been derived rather from a gallimaufry of familiar models. From Madame la Marquise de Saint Quinn came the shapely tilt of the nose. The mouth was a mere replica of Cupid's bow, lacquered scarlet and strung with the littlest pearls. No apple tree, no wall of peaches had not been robbed, nor any Tyrian rose garden for the glory of Miss Dobson's cheeks. Her neck was imitation marble. Her hands and feet were of very mean proportions. She had no waist to speak of. Yet, though a Greek would have railed at her asymmetry and an Elizabethan have called her gypsy, Miss Dobson now, in the midst of the Edwardian era, was the toast of two hemispheres. Late in her teens, she had become an orphan and a governess. Her grandfather... Her grandfather had refused her appeal for a home or an allowance on the ground that he would not be burdened with the upshot of a marriage which he had once forbidden and not yet forgiven. Lightly, however, prompted by curiosity or by remorse, he had asked her to spend a week or so of his declining years with him, and she, resting between two engagements, one at Hammerstein's Victoria, NYC, the other at the Follies Bourgiers, Paris, and having never been in Oxford, had so far let bygones be bygones as to come and gratify the old man's whim. 
It may be that she still resented his indifference to those early struggles which even now she shuddered to recall. For a governess life she had been indeed notably unfit. Hard she had thought it, that penury should force her back into the schoolroom she was scarce out of, there to champion the sums and maps and conjugations she had never tried to master. Hating her work, she had failed signally to pick up any learning from her little pupils and had been driven from house to house, a sullen and most ineffectual maiden. The sequence of her situations was the swifter by reason of her pretty face. Was there a grown-up son? Always he fell in love with her and she would let his eyes trifle boldly with hers across the dinner table. When he offered her his hand, she would refuse it, not because she knew her place, but because she did not love him. Even had she been a good teacher, her presence could not have been tolerated thereafter. Her corded trunk, heavier by another packet of Billy Dew and a month's salary in advance, was soon carried up the stairs of some other house. It chanced that she came at length to be governess in a large family that had Gibbs for its name and Notting Hill for its background. Edward, the eldest son, was a clerk in the city who spent his evenings in the practice of amateur, con amateur conjuring. He was a freckled youth with hair that bristled in places where it should have lain smooth, and he fell in love with Zuleika Dooley at first sight during the high tea. In the course of the evening, he sought to win her admiration by a display of all his tricks. These were familiar to his household, and the children had been sent to bed. The mother was dozing long before the seance was at an end. But Miss Dobson, unaccustomed to any gaieties, sat fascinated by the young man's sleight of hand, marveling that a top hat could hold so many goldfish, and a handkerchief turned so swiftly into a silver florin. All that night she lay wide awake, haunted by the miracles he had wrought. Next evening, when she asked him to repeat them, Nay, he whispered, I cannot bear to deceive the girl I love. Permit me to explain the tricks. So he explained them. His eyes sought hers across the bowl of goldfish. His fingers trembled as he taught her to manipulate the magic canister. One by one she mastered the paltry secrets. Her respect for him waned with every revelation. He complimented her on her skill. I could not do it more neatly myself, he said. Oh, dear Miss Dobson, will you but accept my hand? All these things shall be yours. The cards, the canister, the goldfish, the demon egg cup. All yours. Zuleika, with ravishing coyness, answered that if he would give her them now, she would think it over. The swain consented, and at bedtime she retired with the gift under her arm. In the light of her bedroom condol, Marguerite hung not in great ecstasy. Marguerite hung not in greater ecstasy over the jewel casket than hung Zuleika over the box of tricks. She clasped her hands over the tremendous possibilities it held for her, manumission from her bondage, wealth, fame, power. Stealthily, so soon as the house slumbered, she packed a small outfit, embedding therein the precious gift. Noiselessly, she shut the lid of her trunk, corded it, shouldered it, stole down the stairs with it. Outside, how that chain had grated, and her shoulder, how it was aching. She soon found a cab. She took a night sanctuary in some railway hotel. Next day, she moved into a small room in a lodging house off the Edgware Road. And there, for a whole week, she was sedulous in the practice of her tricks. Then she inscribed her name on the books of a, quote, juvenile party entertainments agency, end of quote. The Christmas holidays were at hand, and before long she got an engagement. It was a great evening for her. Her repertory was, it must be confessed, old and obvious, but the children, in deference to their hostess, pretended not to know how the tricks were done and assumed their prettiest airs of wonder and delight. One of them even pretended to be frightened and was led howling from the room. In fact, the whole thing went off splendidly. The hostess was charmed and told Zuleika that a glass of lemonade would be served to her in the hall. Other engagements soon followed. Zuleika was very, very happy. 
I cannot claim for her that she had a genuine passion for her art. The true conjurer finds his guerdon in the consciousness of work done perfectly and for its own sake. Lucre and applause are not necessary to him. If he were set down with the materials of his art on a desert island, he would yet be quite happy. He would not cease to produce the barber's pole from his mouth. To the indifferent winds, he would still speak his patter, and even in the last throes of starvation would not eat his live rabbit or his goldfish. Zuleika, on a desert island, would have spent most of her time in looking for a man's footprint. She was indeed far too human a creature to care much for art. I do not say that she took her work lightly. She thought she had genius, and she liked to be told that this was so, but mainly she loved her work as a means of mere self-display. The frank admiration which in whatsoever house she entered the grown-up sons flashed on her, their eagerness to see her to the door, their impressive way of putting her into her omnibus. These were the things she reveled in. She was a nymph to whom men's admiration was the greater part of life. By day, whenever she went into the street, she was conscious that no man passed her without a stare. And this consciousness gave a sharp zest to her outings. Sometimes she was followed to her door. Crude flattery, which she was too innocent to fear. Even when she went into the haberdashers to make some little purchase of tape or ribbon, or into the grocers, for she was an epicure in her humble way, to buy a tin of potted meat for her supper, the homage of the young men behind the counter did flatter and exhilarate her. As the homage of men became for her more and more a matter of course, the more subtly necessary was it to her happiness, the more she won of it, the more she treasured it. She was alone in the world and it saved her from any moment of regret that she had neither home nor friends. For her, the streets that lay around her had no squalor, since she paced them always in the gold nimbus of her fascinations. Her bedroom seemed not mean nor lonely to her since the little square of glass, nailed above the washstand, was ever there to reflect her face. Therein too, indeed, she was ever peering. She would droop her head from side to side. She would bend it forward and see herself from beneath her eyelashes then tilt it back and watch herself over her supercilious chin. And she would smile, frown, pout, languish, let all the emotions hover upon her face. And always she seemed to herself lovelier than she had ever been. <laughs>